Have you ever dreamed of starting your own podcast? Well, you can. It's simple, it's easy, and best of all, it's free. By going to anchor.fm, you can start your own podcast today and have your own show up and ready to go. Anchor's graphic user interface is user friendly and you get paid for your content by setting up a Stripe account. Go to anchor.fm. Again, that's anchor.fm and start your podcast today. Welcome to the Living Healthy Podcast, where you can improve your quality of life by making solid and informed decisions. I'm your host, Eddie Randall. Thank you for tuning in to Season 3, Episode 2 of the Living Healthy Podcast. Your continued listening and your continued support are greatly appreciated. Please feel free to check out our latest merchandise at the Living Healthy Podcast store. The link is in the description of the podcast. We all use plastic. It is a normal part of our lives. Plastic is used in everything from key fobs, toothbrushes, cell phones, TVs, cars, houses, and even space shuttles. Some would ask, where would we be if it were not for plastic to create everyday products that we use? That being said, not all plastic is good for you, especially when it comes to packaging our food and drinks. There are plastic packaging, plastic utensils, and plastic drinkware that are questionable. So tonight, I'll be talking about food safety in regard to plastic, and I'll touch a bit on food safety in general. Tonight's podcast is entitled, The Truth Behind Plastic and Food Safety. In the United States, we account for using just over 36 million tons of plastic a year. This can cause an issue in regard to PFAS, polyfluoroalkyl substances, and other dangerous chemicals like BPA and phthalates. They put our health at risk when they leach from the plastic packaging into the foods and drinks we consume. With the vast amount of food products that use plastic for containers, cartons, bottles, wrapping, and jugs, this is the gateway for those dangerous chemicals to end up inside our bodies. One way that plastic can leach their chemicals is through a process called fluorination. Fluorination is essentially treating plastic, in particular treating polyethylene, with fluorine. What fluorine does is it strengthens the the plastic or the bottle and it makes it strong enough to prevent a chemical from leaking out. That also, it also makes it strong enough to allow a bottle containing a food product like ketchup to retain its shape and to prevent paneling. Paneling is when the air pressure inside the bottle becomes less than the outside air and it puckers or buckles. The downside is that fluorination can cause PFAS to leak into products, and since chemicals are fluorinated, they tend to last forever and are therefore deemed forever chemicals. These chemicals can cause endocrine disruption as well as cancer. I did a podcast on PFAS during Season 2 of the podcast, and I invite you to check that out if you haven't done so already. PFAS are everywhere. And there has been a large concern as they are produced unintentionally in food packaging, shampoo bottles, cosmetics, household cleaning products, as well as pesticides. This comes after the EPA has released information on PFAS forming in pesticide containers. They have an article on their website that was released in September of 2022 called EPA Releases Data on Leaching of PFAS in Fluorinated Packaging. They essentially stated that they studied mosquito side products and discovered that PFAS formed after the products were made and more or less did so due to fluorination of the plastic container. PFAS are dangerous and that they can cause liver damage, kidney cancer, testicular cancer, low birth weight in children, and they can negatively affect blood pressure. According to the CDC, on top of the detriments I just mentioned, PFAS also cause high cholesterol 
and decreased vaccine response in children. We are exposed to PFAS and PFOs through contamination in the environment, drinking water, water repellent materials, and firefighting foam. For the sake of this podcast, I'm focusing on our exposure from plastics. Phthalates are another chemical of concern, as they are used to make plastic both durable and flexible. As an example, they are used in plastics for microwave meals. These polycarbonate plastics are deemed microwave safe. The thing is, regulation of these plastics is not an exact science. The way the FDA regulates these plastics is that if they contain a low percentage of phthalates, then they can be called phthalate-free and or microwave safe. What I am essentially saying is that the percentage of phthalates in the plastics made to contain these products can vary and the amount you are exposed to depends on you putting that plastic meal in the microwave and obviously how often you have these kinds of meals. If you think about it, when you take a microwavable meal and cook it in the container it came in, after you remove the meal from the microwave, the plastic is very hot to the touch and flexible. This is when you are actually releasing the chemicals that are used to make the plastic container. The plastic should have a number on it, surrounded by a triangle. It would either be on the bottom of the plastic or on the box itself. A number for what is deemed microwave safe would have a 5 in that triangle. This number signifies polypropylene and is considered safe for hot food. There is a clear correlation of our exposure to harmful chemicals in plastic by consuming the food they are heated in. I'll go into the system about the different numbers and the relatively safe and outright unsafe plastics to use a little later on in the podcast. Now, I don't want to demonize manufacturers and make it seem like they don't care about us or that they're giving us unsafe products. They're giving us safe products and they are producing products legally within the federal guidelines presented to them. They provide the plastic containers not only as a way to contain the product, but also as a way to ship it to us. They also provide the convenience of not having to worry about how you would cook it especially if you have a microwave meal for lunch and take it with you to work. They'd assume that you'd place it in the microwave. Uh, That's why they have warning labels about how hot it will be and to allow it to sit before touching it. Given how chemicals leach from these plastics, you can still buy your microwave meal and put them in the microwave. But the thing that you want to do is to have a microwave safe ceramic bowl or plate. The comparison in safety between ceramic and plastic is like night and day. So this is how you get to, well, this is the opportunity you have rather to limit your exposure to chemicals and still eat your microwave meals if you choose to do so. Bisphenol A or BPA is another chemical used in canned foods and plastics. In plastic, it's used to add strength to the plastic bottle or container. In canned food products, a BPA epoxy is sprayed into the can as a barrier lining used to prevent foods from tasting like the metal can and as a way to prevent corrosion and having that corrosion spoil the taste of the food. Essentially, it prevents the can from rusting and it holds up well against heat and also as a preservative for the food product. The FDA had deemed BPA safe and approved it way back in the 1960s. However, back in 2012, the FDA did ban the use of BPA in baby bottles, baby formula packaging, and sippy cups. This was in response to evidence showing that BPA can disrupt the endocrine system and that it could affect child development. So as a preemptive measure, manufacturers of baby formula and baby bottles decided to stop using BPA in those particular products. As of 2022, the FDA is reassessing its stance on BPA. Many manufacturers offer BPA-free products, which include anything from pitchers, glasses, canned foods, and toothbrushes. I would opt to avoid any product with BPA in it. As far as canned food products, the FDA does not require manufacturers to let you know whether or not they use BPA. So I would avoid plastics when you can, and I would limit or avoid canned foods, especially if they're not marked as BPA-free. 
Aside from the effects of BPA on children, it can drastically affect adults as well. BPA can cause infertility, weight gain, hormonal issues, and it is also a known carcinogen. There's an article on Science Direct by Ma, Lu, Wu, and several others called The Adverse Health Effects of Bisphenol A and Related Toxicity Mechanisms. They compiled and studied data from several studies and concluded that BPA is an endocrine disruptor. It can affect organs, fertility, the immune response, and has been shown to be carcinogenic in animals. The Short History Behind Plastic In the 1850s, British metallurgist Alexander Parks created and patented Pakistan, which is a thermoplastic that could be heated up and molded into any desired shape. Needless to say, the rest is history. Plastic has many uses, but the primary use is to make life easy and more convenient. In addition, using plastic, especially when it comes to everyday single use or minimal use items, is the more economical and convenient option. Some products can take decades or longer to break down in landfills and would add considerable cost to the product if they were used. This makes plastic the cheaper alternative for manufacturers. Plastic comes from sources like coal, crude oil, and natural gas. As an example, at an oil refinery, crude oil undergoes a process known as fractional distillation. Monomers undergo polymerization and many types of products can be made as resins are formed. How to understand the plastic you're using. I had just mentioned that all plastics are not considered equal. There are certain plastics that are relatively safe to hold drinks and food and to store food in. In contrast, there are plastics that are not safe for holding food or drink, but are perfectly fine for storing items for other uses. Aside from limiting your exposure to plastic that you eat and drink from, the way you can tell what type of plastic you're dealing with is by the IRC or Resin Identification Code. Before I get into that, let me explain. The Resin Identification Code was not made in order for consumers to tell what plastics are safe. Instead, its intended purpose was to make recycling easier for the recycling industry. RIC codes were implemented back in 1988 by the Plastic Industry Association. The purpose of the code was to make sorting plastic easier for recycling purposes. How it helps consumers is that it can help you to understand what the plastic is made of and allow you to make better choices in avoiding certain plastics. Some examples of the resin identification code include 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and seven. These numbers are located usually under the bottle of under the uh, the bottom of the bottle or container, and it's enclosed in a triangle. RIC number one is polyethylene terephthalate, and it's abbreviated as either PETE or PET. Polyethylene terephthalate is used to make rope, furniture, carpet, clothes made of polyester single-use soda bottles, single-use water bottles, and single-use food containers. RIC number two is high-density polyethylene and is abbreviated HDPE or PEHD. High-density polyethylene is used to make plastic bags at the grocery store, yogurt tubs, milk jugs, disposable personal protection suits, plastic chairs, plastic mailing envelopes, and plastic bottle crates. RIC number three is polyvinyl chloride and is abbreviated PVC or V. Pinyl, excuse me, polyvinyl chloride is used to make shower curtains, fencing, home siding, toys, patio furniture, and bubble wrap. RIC number four is low-density polyethylene and is abbreviated LDPE or PELD. Low-density polyethylene is used for plastic bags that hold bread, cling film for storing food, frozen food bags, ketchup bottles, mustard bottles, and plastic freezer bags. RIC number five is polypropylene and is abbreviated as PP. 
Uses include automobile parts, food containers, sour cream tubs, Tupperware, toys, wire insulation, and hot beverage cups. RIC number six is polystyrene and is abbreviated as PS. Uses include makeup cases, disposable plastic forks, spoons, as well as styrofoam plates and cups. And although you may not see it in this form anymore, it was also used as styrofoam popcorn for shipping fragile items. RIC number seven is known as other plastics or miscellaneous. Now these are miscellaneous plastics which include acrylic, bioplastic, nylon, and fiberglass. It is abbreviated as O for other. Uses include car headlight lenses and safety glasses. Our biggest risk for exposure comes from food and personal care items. For the sake of the topic of this podcast, I will talk about food safety as that is literally the primary vector of exposure. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting the podcast. The Living Healthy Podcast is listed on many platforms, including Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Bullhorn, and many others. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to check out the Living Healthy Podcast channel on YouTube. Also, if you have any questions or would like me to discuss a particular topic or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me at livinghealthylivinghealthy at gmail.com. Food Safety General Regulations To understand how plastic that comes into contact with food is regulated, I'm going to briefly touch on food safety and regulation as a whole. We've come a long way in regard to food safety, and we all take for granted that our food is what it is and that it's packaged in safe material that won't make us ill when we consume it. In the early 1900s, Manufacturers got away with a lot of what we would call unbelievable and severe violations. Back then, some were by accident and others were downright deliberate. Rats, insects, and their waste made their way into processed meats. Meat from diseased animals were sold and a lot of meat was mislabeled in order to save money as some meat looks and tastes the same. Unless you saw what animal it came from, sometimes you wouldn't know the difference. Zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that are spread from animal to human, were prevalent. In addition, toxic chemicals were used as preservatives, and some were used just because it saved money. In 1906, Upton St. Clair released a book called The Jungle. He opened the eyes of Americans to the horrors of the meatpacking industry. In response, President Roosevelt passed the Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906, and he gave the USDA greater power to regulate and inspect the meatpacking industry. Also, the Food and Drug Act of 1906 was passed and piggybacked on the Meat Inspection Act. The difference is that it prevented misbranding and prevented poisons from being sold in food, alcohol, and medicines. It also requires manufacturers to list active drug ingredients, Prior to this act, it was commonplace to use morphine, cocaine, and formaldehyde in the manufacture of some foods and medicines. Granted, you are inevitably exposed to some contaminants in your food, which are unavoidable. Manufacturers work within the regulations of the federal government, and they do want to produce safe and wholesome products. That being said, on occasion, you will have a rodent fall into a vat of processed meat, and it will become part of the food you eat. That being said, on occasion, you will have a rodent fall into a vat of processed meat, and it will become part of the food you eat. However, as I've stated, we are far from the practices of the late 1800s and early 1900s. The FDA allows certain contaminants, but at a limited amount of exposure. As examples, the FDA allows the following. Peanut butter can have no more than one rodent hair per 100 grams of peanut butter. 
a 16 ounce jar is roughly 480 ounces. So you should have no more than four and a half rodent hairs and about 140 insect parts per jar. Ground spices are another matter. As an example, a 1.25 ounce bottle of ground thyme can have an essence of 600 insect body parts, including feces. A two ounce bottle of ground paprika can have about five rodent hairs. Lastly, in a six ounce can of ground pepper, you can have up to around 1,200 insect body parts and insect excrement. You get the point. I had the same professor for microbiology and anatomy and physiology. She mentioned that the FDA allows like one rodent hair and four roach legs per eight ounce box of raisins. And if the content were higher, that we run the risk of getting sick. She said, do not eat the very last of anything, as most of that settles down to the bottom. And she used the example of seeing students eating those small bags of chips, and when getting down to the bottom, they raise the bag to their head and tap it to get the crumbs out. Now that the federal government has demanded accountability for the manufacturer's processes, what gained traction in the following decades was the packaging and the toxins and carcinogens in some of the plastics used to contain and ship those food products. Health problems associated with chemicals leaching from plastic. Although the FDA regulates food contact surfaces in regard to plastic, heating and scratching them can cause the chemicals used to make the plastic leach into foods. There are a significant amount of chemicals that go into making plastic, and repeated exposure can lead to a plethora of health issues. On the NIH website, there's an article by Gro, Bacos, Carney, and others called Overview of Known Plastic Packaging Associated Chemicals and Their Hazards. They state that there are over 900 chemicals likely associated with plastic packaging and over 3,000 likely associated with health issues, and 63 of them are known to be hazardous to humans. For the most part, plastics that have the RIC number 1, 2, 4, and 5 are food safe, and plastics that are not food safe will have the RIC number of 3, 6, or 7. BPA is a primary culprit linked to health issues. BPA mimics estrogen, and it is a known endocrine disruptor. Even though estrogen is a female sex hormone, both men and women make estrogen naturally, but women make it at a significantly higher level than men, but it does affect both sexes. What it does is it acts like estrogen, and it either blocks or replaces estrogen causing ailments such as diabetes, cancer, hypertension, attention problems, memory problems, and infertility. In the International Journal of Endocrinology, there's an article by Matsuzakt, Kamaraska, Debeck, and Hermanowitz entitled, The Impact of Bisphenol A on Fertility, Reproductive System, and Development, a Review of the Literature. What they did was they took information from 187 studies over an 18-year period. They determined that in women, BPA caused infertility, delayed female puberty, reduced ovarian supply, and it negatively impacted ovulation. They also state that BPA reduces sperm count in men, and that 98% of couples who were experiencing infertility issues had high levels of BPA in their systems. They also found that it may also be associated with erectile dysfunction. BPA is something that you definitely want to limit your exposure to. It can also cause breast cancer and ovarian cancer in women and testicular and prostate cancer in men. Phthalates can cause obesity, diabetes, infertility, asthma, and delayed development. Polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, can cause brain cancer, cardiomyopathy, lung cancer, and liver cancer. Most have heard about the tragic derailment in Ohio that has released 1 million pounds of vinyl chloride and, and the associated toxic effects. 
Vinyl chloride is used to make PVC. PFAS or polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances are used in things like uh, pizza boxes and disposable plates. Their job is to prevent greasy foods from soaking through the packaging. PFAS can also cause ADHD, cognition problems, diabetes, kidney disease, and hypertension. Environmental Health published an article by Pitter, Czar, Barberi, and others called Polyfluoral Substances are associated with elevated blood pressure and hypertension in highly exposed young adults. They performed a cross-sectional study of people who are exposed to PFAS in drinking water, and they determined that the blood pressure increased in individuals in conjunction with the increase of PFAS in the blood. Personal Care Products and Plastic Most personal care products contain either BPA or phthalates. Some examples are nail polish, toothbrushes, hairspray, shampoo, hair gel, moisturizers, and lotions. For nail polish, phthalates are used to keep the polish from cracking. It's put in hairspray to allow it to be pliable and you're to also keep your hair in shape. BPA gives a toothbrush rigidity and yet it makes it flexible when brushing. In shampoos, moisturizers, and lotions, Phthalates are used to stabilize the product, enhance fragrance, and it also acts as a solvent. Thankfully, there are many products that are phthalate-free and BPA-free. In particular, toothbrushes are a big deal for obvious reasons. Some bristles are made from nylon and also contain BPA, but there are bamboo brushes out there which contain no plastic. In addition, there are BPA-free toothbrushes. They can tend to be a bit more on the expensive side, but anything you can do to limit your exposure will only help you in the long run. Unfortunately, phthalates can have many, many names. Next time you shop for cosmetics or for skincare products, look for phthalates under these names. DIB, dibutyl phthalate. DINB, disononyl phthalate. DEHP, di 2 ethyl phthalate DMP, dimethyl phthalate BBP, benzyl butyl phthalate DINOP, n octyl phthalate and DIDP, disoesyl phthalate Alternatives to plastic There are many alternatives to plastic such as regular drinking glasses. Stainless steel drinkware are also viable options. Instead of using a plastic fork or spoon, use good old fashioned stainless steel utensils. Toss the plastic plates and opt for simple choices like ceramic plates. Ways of exposure to PVC, phthalates, and BPA that you may not have thought of. A person could drive themselves crazy wondering what they're exposed to. The purpose of this podcast is not to do that. We are already exposed to many things just by living. The purpose of this episode is to not instill fear, but rather to educate in order to help you to be aware and to make mindful selections and to limit your exposure. That being said, there are simple ways that we are exposed to harmful effects of plastics without even knowing it. For example, that blow-up kiddie pool that the kids and the family dog love to splash around in, it's very likely that it's made of PVC. There are ones out there that are made of polypropylene, which are a safer option. Since I've mentioned summer fun of the blow-up pool, we have to fill up that pool with water. Well, that garden hose is made of PVC. And while it's safe to use it to fill up the kiddie pool with water and to play around in that water, it's not generally safe to drink water from that water hose. Avoid cheap plastic toys. Toys do not contain a lot of toxins like they did in the past, but it is best to buy toys from reputable manufacturers. There are less likely a chance of them using illegal or misguided tactics as a reputable and stable company stands to lose more than a company that's out for quick profit and then to quickly shut down. 
Another thing to avoid is vinyl flooring. It's best to opt for non-toxic ceramic tile. Ceramic tile is a much safer option, option to vinyl flooring. There are toxins, fire retardants, and some questionable materials that go into constructing vinyl flooring. BPA-free shower curtains are more popular than ever as PVC shower curtains can leach their toxins from the heat generated by a shower or a bath. Receipt paper is another vector of exposure. Personally, I like having my paper receipt in case I need to return something, but it may be in your best interest to opt for an email receipt, as most companies now offer. Receipt paper, unfortunately, it does contain BPA and continued touching of paper made of BPA increases your um, chances of exposure because it's absorbed through the skin. That's going to do it for episode two of season three of the Living Healthy Podcast. I hope you found this podcast informative, beneficial, and I hope I've motivated you to make the decision that you would like to make. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you next time. And remember, living healthy creates a better you.